So hello everybody and welcome to this very special episode of Culturenomics with Arjun. So I promised you a surprise and I'm now delivering it. As I say it, it's always great when a plan comes together and I'm very thankful to the team who I'll name later in the show who sort of helped pull this together. So I'm in the city of Canals, also known for the Van Gogh Museum, where I'm actually going to be talking to the chief commercial officer of one of the largest and most influential fintech payment player in the world. With that said, I guess I've given away the surprise. Roland, welcome to the couch. And it's a pleasure to be in your offices and thank you for having me in Amsterdam. Thank you right. and uh, welcome. Great to see you. Thank you. So my pleasure. It's been great. We've been here since yesterday. Um, I guess before we start, and I wanted to share something funny with you and actually uh, give credit to the Couchonomics team. So last night we coined the phrase, if the guest doesn't come to the couch, we bring the couch to the guest. This is the first time we have left, I guess, the comfort of our little studio we have in Dubai, flown half the way across the world for this episode. But it's been a great experience, and I'm fairly confident that this is going to be an interesting conversation. Cool, and no, no issues uh, checking in the couch? <laughs> and actually, they've got the colors correct, right? We, we are a gray and a yellow uh, set up there, and uh, I, I think by coincidence, we are gray and yellow here too. So that's great. We've got a lot to cover. Yeah. Um, we've, got a, we've got a long list of questions. So I want to get right into it. But before we get into it, uh, <laughs> I want to talk about this, this, this term that I'd come across a few years ago called unified commerce. Now, to give you a little bit of background, I think I shared before we started, uh, I, I used to be a payments practitioner before I walked into my current role where I'm a partner at a consulting firm. And during that sort of era, while I was grappling with solving the problem of omni-channel, I came across an article that Adyan had written, and front and center was a term called unified commerce. And I'll, I'll give you the honest truth, it bamboozled me. <laughs> right? And pretty much everybody else in my team, right? I think we've come to understand what it is. But what would be great is to hear from your own words, what does unified commerce actually mean to a merchant? So the world of retail has been known for, has known a lot of terms over the years. And um, I think um, it started with something called multi-channel when 15 years ago, we were talking about, hey, you should not only sell in retail stores, but here's also the internet, um, and there's call centers, there's different ways to reach customers. Uh, then a few years later, that got uh, the new term got coined, which was uh, omni-channel, because there were all these other channels being developed. Um, you can now also start selling uh, um, on mobile phones, for example, and, and more and more channels came. Now. We coined this term, I think we coined, someone coined, we started to use this term unified commerce. And I think this is no longer about there's channels you can use to sell your products. Um, but I think it's much more taking the con consumer into account, um, the customer into account. And, and it's about, hey, there's a world where there is a consumer who is now much more in control. There's many ways they can interact with you as a brand. They can follow everything they want to know on the internet. They can walk into your stores, but they can also use all sorts of technology to research price and everything about your product, but also your competitors' products, etc. cetera. And um, in this world of choice, in this world of shifting balance from the retailer towards the consumer who's more and more in control, they decide where and how to interact with brands. That's why where unified commerce becomes a big theme because unified commerce is about enabling your consumer to interact with you however they like and making sure you have an infrastructure that connects all the data that is um, enabling that. So unified commerce is about connecting and having an infrastructure that's giving you the ability to connect the consumer information on how to interact with you online, as well as in store in multiple countries uh, and making sure you can service them in the way that they want to be serviced in a consistent way. Um, and unified commerce is all about making sure you have the technology to ultimately deliver that. And I think the main shift is we're looking at things no longer from a merchant's perspective, but much more from a consumer perspective and how can we help them better. 
So I'm going to go a bit deeper on this, right, if you don't mind. I don't mind. All right, excellent, right? So we, I've heard words, enabling, relevancy, data, connecting, infrastructure, right, mm -hmm. cross-jurisdiction, yeah. taking a view from a consumer perspective. I yeah. get all of that. They're all good words. Do your merchants really understand unified commerce today? Great, great question. Um, practical experience. I had a meeting with a large global retail me merchant earlier today. Uh, real, real story. And <clears throat> they had the same experience. Like, hey, we've come across this term, unified commerce, a few years ago, Adyen, and we want to understand what does that mean for us. Um, and, and we've been working together for quite some time. And they today, this morning, said, we really get this. We understand what this means uh, because they see that um, um, our platform is enabling them to get real insights into how their consumers are interacting with them. We're giving them insights that were never available before. And a very specific example, uh, something we looked at this morning, is we are able, because they use our platform for uh, handling transactions in physical stores as well as uh, online and in, in, in their app, um, we, have re we have interfaces, reports, that show them exactly their percentage of shoppers that shop with them online only, shoppers that uh, shop with them only in stores, as well as the percentage of shoppers that interact with them on both channels. And they find this really valuable, but they also recognize that shoppers that interact with them on both uh, channels, in store as well as online, spend more. They're more loyal, they visit them more regularly, um, th th there's much more brand loyalty with those customers, more spent, um, and better relationships. Um, so the fact that they're able to see that with our data is something that's incredibly valuable for them. They had never access to this sort of data before. And these are this is where they want to get their customers. Their specific objectives is to get from like, let's say 30% of their shoppers uh, shopping with them, interacting with them on those different channels. How do we get that to 50%? Because we know we have better relationship with customers. They're gonna be more happy. We're gonna see them more often. Um, and, and that's the goal. And it starts with having that insights. And um, the thing that we are eh, enabling them to do is um, by using the, having those insights, they can recognize these people and then they can start to think about, hey, how, how can we make their experience as shoppers more convenient? By storing payment details, by uh, making it easier to get a refund if they uh, bring back an online order into a store, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, and I think this is, this is important. And I, yeah. I, I think it's very interesting to hear that there are merchants who are now starting to understand it. Yeah. I think it's a journey. Yeah. I, I don't think anyone's going to get a word. I think what's very interesting, and I go back to my own time, is that if you can power, empower retailers, small and big, yeah. in terms of being able to give their give the customer an experience that he or she has never received in the past, the ability to price differently, the ability to be more relevant, then the conversation goes away from the 30 bips on the price, right? It becomes more around how you can actually help me drive top line and bottom line, right? Where it's more than 30 bips at play, yeah. right? Um, I think it is definitely where the market is heading. I think the change management aspect of this is something which I guess is not underestimated, I assume, right? Now, yeah, 100% uh, right. And especially in, in, in retail, things don't move super fast. Uh, there's so much legacy infrastructure out there. So it's, it's a long-term play. Um, I, I think if you say, like, do retailers understand unified commerce? I think the big, big difference is that the moment they experience it, they have it operational, they get access to the data, they see the data. That's when unified commerce changes from this promise we all talk about, but in reality, nothing happens. It becomes a reality. It becomes a real thing. And it, it is now a real thing. And I think the pandemic has pushed a lot. It's helped accelerate things because there was much more need for data, much more uh, 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 hunger for, for data and insights. What's going on here? And companies that were running with this omni-channel omni unified commerce setup, they get access to that data. And then suddenly it becomes like, oh, wow, now I get it. This is super helpful. Um, so I, I think 
pandemic from that perspective was really painful, but it's also unlocked a lot of these, these benefits and accelerated the reality of it. No, thank you for that. You've also given me the segue for the next question. Okay. Right? So, uh, you know, the world of payments is going through more disruption, arguably, uh, compared to any other sector of financial services. Uh, I, I, I'm not here to rank any of them, right? Now, whether it is regulatory shifts which are going on, whether it's open banking, open finance on one end, um, uh, whether it is the changing consumer behavior where they want to adopt different channels, the growth of contactless. Um, the more important, interesting one for me is, you know, digitization of everything and so on and so forth. If I request you to take a step back and give me, in your words, what are going to be the defining trends disruptive trends for the foreseeable future. I'm not asking for the next 20 years, right? Not writing a report on that. The next two to three years, what do you think are the three or four important trends which are going to define the future of commerce and so therefore will influence the, the, the future of payments? You know, the funny thing is that um, I think at the end we've, we've never been the most inventor, visionary company, you know, predicting what the world will look like. We've always been very pragmatic and we've always been very close working with our customers, hearing what their problems are and trying to fix it, to come with solutions that help them right now. Um, and that basically gives us a sight on, you know, what are the current problems? Where are companies heading and how can we help, uh, help them? Um, and I think there's a few things that we're, we're seeing that are really current, where a lot of companies are investing, are looking for, which will be very um, um, active in the coming years. Um, now, we talked a lot about unified commerce earlier, so that's a big thing. With that is data. So um, to get real, real good insights into customer behavior, but also using data to help recognize shoppers, to give them a much better experience, is a big thing. So more and more loyalty, more and more situations coming where payment disappear, uh, less and less active payment, but payment on the background, yep. uh, in and out, uh, nothing happens. You walk out of a store, a payment is done. Hey, I didn't do anything. Another word, um, like invisible payments. <laughs> invisible payments, that, 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 that is a big thing. A lot of people are working on. A lot of pilots, so it's going to take time, but clearly something that, that, that that's top of mind, which, which I think, yeah, uh, evidently you'll, you'll see much more of. Um, a completely different area, which steps away a bit from, from retail um, uh, uh, in that sense, is much more around um, the role of platforms in, in our economy. Um, again, ha this has had a big push, I think, by, um, by the pandemic, um, um, the, the, the digital transformation that has accelerated has led to a lot of uh, um, uh, platforms in the sense of cloud-based businesses that are enabling smaller merchants in specific industries to run their business using an internet-based platform solution. So what does that mean? If I run a coffee bar, um, if I would start a new coffee bar uh, next month, I would really, really like likely to run it on a cloud-based infrastructure from a platform that helps me with cash register, accounting, uh, the software I need to do, the payroll for my employees, payments uh, and other things, all already integrated, configured in this cloud-based solution. I create an account, off I go. I can focus on running and decorating and uh, doing all the, the things I'm good at. And all this software is, is just there. Um, we're seeing that these platforms are growing really quickly in many different industries. It goes from restaurants, uh, traditional retail, but also dry cleaners, undertakers, spas, anything really. There is a platform that can really help you. Yep. Now, um, it makes a lot of sense. It makes running, setting up a business much easier. And of course, they're collecting and uh, there's all this collective experience in these platforms that they all benefit from. So it makes a lot of sense, I find. Now, what does that mean for payments? What does it mean for a trend? It means, um, on the one hand, uh, we started to work with a lot of these platforms, enabling them to offer payments to their customers, smaller merchants. Um, but with that, 
you're getting into space where these platforms are building all this specific verticalized knowledge about an industry. So the moment I start this coffee bar, they know, hey, maybe uh, we know where you can get your uh, cheap uh, coffee beans. There's five other people that want to buy them. Uh, you want to join? Oh, yeah, of course, that makes sense. Um, but also by offering payments, they're looking at, hey, maybe we could also offer a, a short-term loan. Uh, you need a new coffee machine? Here's $10,000. We can help you get that uh, uh, set up quickly. And as you do your payments with us, we know everything about your business. We know you're a good company. Um, that's easy. So um, we're seeing that this growth of platforms triggers, triggers a lot of additional solutions around payments and banking as a service uh, because that's all connected and um, nah, that, that's a super interesting development because yeah, we, we've got a few tools in our toolbox and that can help. And that's the tools I want to talk <laughs> about, right? So, yeah. so there's not a day which goes by where we don't talk about either the platform economy or embedded finance. And, and I, I heard you say BAS, uh, I heard you say yeah. platform, I heard you say ecosystems, uh, or maybe I made it up, but embedded finance. So is Adyan now extending their proposition beyond core payments, right? And are you truly and earnestly getting into the embedded finance play? Yeah, we are. Um, you know, in everything we do, payments is the core of our business. It will continue to be the, the core of our business. I mean, that's not something we're changing. Um, the thing is, we do look at ourselves no longer as purely a payments technology company. No, we're a financial technology company. So we're expanding. We, we, we got our banking license in 2017. Um, and, and that serves as the basis for us to expand. And uh, we've already launched an issuing proposition. Um, we're offering bank accounts. And uh, absolutely, we're, uh, we're looking at starting to offer loans and, and other services like that. It's a long-term approach. So it's not like expect us to, uh, uh, to really um, uh, run 50% of the business on, on these additional services in the next two years. We're doing this for the long term, um, but, but we very clearly see demand for our customers uh, and we see lots of opportunity to make this so much more seamless um, uh, using our platform that it's totally something we're very focused around. The reason we think we have something unique to offer is that we run this all on A, our single platform. So that platform that handles payments for our customers in their stores online is a single platform. That means all the transactions end up in the same place. The settlement we give to our merchants is always identical. That's really easy to interact with. But also having a single platform means the moment payments come in, we instantly can move them to our customer's bank account. That saves them time. They get access to the money faster. But for there, from there, we can also issue it. We can issue cards. We can give them that loan all in one single place. That's so convenient, um, and that, that is pretty unique in, in the infrastructure we're building. I think you started by saying that you're not a visionary and a pragmatic organization. I think if I may say, you also don't talk a lot about what all you do, if I may say. Uh, there is a certain, how do I say, uh, reservedness about yeah. what, how Adyan talks about themselves. And this is not a bad thing. It's just an observation from the outside. Um, you know, there's um, the typical Silicon Valley approach to building a business, which you talk a lot about what you're going to do, and then you try and get it going. Um, I guess we're a bit more uh, Dutch in our approach, where we like to get things working before we really focus on that. Oh, and then we'll talk about it. But uh, that's a bit in our nature. Um, I think we're ready to be a bit more talking, uh, talkative about it. But, uh, you know, these things uh, don't change that quickly. Hopefully but this little we're, podcast we're, will help. <laughs> yeah, this helps. And, we're, you know, we're super excited about, uh, about where this is going. And I think for me personally, you know, I've been with this company now uh, 15 years. And you could say, hey, man, you're an old timer. You, you've seen all this. Well, not at all. This is all new. And therefore, yeah, I, I think we all carry and we share this uh, high level of curiosity of where we where where can we take this what, what can we build together and uh, I think that's driving a lot of us so well it's interesting you say that so this morning I was at the uh, and I don't get the pronunciation correct of Van Gogh but that's my pronunciation apologies uh, uh, for my lack of uh, uh, Dutch pronunciation uh, but I was at the museum uh, I was sitting at the coffee shop and I was going through your uh, latest results 
I think they were the H1 2022 results. Uh, I'm sure a bunch of people thought I was strange. Uh, why am I in a museum reading things about uh, fintech organizations? But I guess that just tells you the nature of the person it is. Three things popped out to me, right? And I, I have three very quick questions on you. Firstly, congratulations. Very impressive. Uh, I think your processing volumes jumped 70% year on year, uh, despite COVID still being there, right? Uh, despite a number of new markets that you have entered, where usually it takes time to kind of beat in, Right. What has been the catalyst behind that? Um, you, you know, typically, in, if, if you look at um, our volumes and, and, and the way the business grows, a lot of the growth that we see every year is, is generated from existing customers on our platform um, that are typically expanding with us. They're either expanding um, by um, taking live transactions in stores and they've previously only uh, worked with us for online, um, they're moving, they're adding new countries. Yeah, so yeah, we, we launched in Japan. Well, there's lots of customers who are like, oh, great, let's go. And um, yeah, the beauty of our model in that sense is that we build a lot of the expansion, the new products we're building is very much done in, in close cooperation with our customers. Hence, we know whatever we build, we'll always build it in such a way that everybody can access it. And therefore, the moment we take these things live, we know there will be demand, there will be volumes. Um, um, so from that perspective, a, lo a lot of this growth is, is generated by that sort of expansion. So you have chosen uh, the right customers. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, or they choose us. Well, well I, I, I'm not sure how to phrase it, but um, you know, we we have a very uh, ambitious group of very global customers that uh, that like what we do, and I think that's the key thing that's driving us. We want to make sure that the way we are work, the way our solution works, yeah, it, it needs to really help them grow their business. And as long as we're able to do that, yeah, they'll give us more traffic because it's good for them. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, so, yeah, w why do we continue to grow? That's a big, big driver. Of course, um, as I said earlier, digital, uh, the acceleration of this digital transformation. Yeah, what does it mean? Well, it means that there's more need for technology in retail. There's more need for technology in the restaurant business, in the supermarket business, in entertainment, cinemas. Uh, you know, a, a lot, a lot of demand for that. And of course, yeah, we're we're pretty well positioned to help these companies. So there's more companies that that are shifting to newer solutions, and yeah, we benefit from that. Second observation, and I think you alluded to it uh, while you were answering the first one. It's very interesting. So, you, so you're still predominantly an e-commerce business. I think about 85% of your processed volumes. 15% of it now comes from point of sale. And I think a lot of people don't really know that Ardian plays. But what's super interesting for me is that you've grown 100% year on year on point of sale, sale volumes. Is that something you continue to expect to see? in the fourth, you know, coming next years, right? And does that really cement, and I'm apologies, I'm partly answering the question, that that cements this whole ideology behind unified commerce? Yeah, no, I, I think this is the, um, you know, th this is the result of companies really seeing the benefit of this approach. Um, and there's a, there's a few factors to why it takes time. We, we started to invest and build um, solutions for, for point of sale yeah, uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, it's a long-term play. It's super complicated. Um, hey, you're dealing with uh, uh, store networks. You're dealing with hardware. You need to get it to people on time. It you know, it's a completely different ballgame. But at the same time, um, yeah, there's massive volume there. And... Um, you know, we do a lot of research. We do a lot of research with consumers to understand uh, not only what do our merchants uh, uh, want, how do they want to interact with their customers, but also how do customers, consumers think about retail in general. And time and time again, whether it's in the US, Europe, APEC, consumers want to go out and shop in stores. There is a role, a very clear role for stores, but the role of the store that's changing and it's changing quickly. Eh? We don't want to go to the store anymore to buy lots of different things we can buy online. Why would we? But we do want to go to a store to have fun, experience a brand, um, you know, get to know a brand, try, touch, feel. 
Um, and, and there is a big, big role there for, for stores, but how they work is changing really rapidly. And that change needs, oh, new ways to interact. So mobile point of sale terminals, ways to capture more data, um, you know, ability to ship goods from your physical store to someone's home, all changing really rapidly. And that needs new technology. And uh, that's why it's growing. Um, and also because, yeah, the world of retail, as I said earlier, a lot of legacy, all technology. So you can't change that really quickly. But it's now happening and it's moving faster. And on the other side, we are also moving into other areas. So where typically we were in retail, you know, with lots of the um, well-known brands, H&M, uh, Nike, all those companies, they work with us. But now we're moving also into processing point of sale transactions for restaurants. Um, lots of the, uh, you know, quick service restaurants are, are working with us. People like Subway. Um, and um, we're looking at supermarkets. So we're broadening also the use cases because self-checkout is coming. It's coming in different ways, but it's also coming to supermarkets and hence there's a need for technology. So yeah, this, we think this is the beginning. There's much more to come and um, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. And I think if, if, if as you said, as this, this migration or transition, whatever the word is, from being predominantly an e-commerce business to becoming a unified commerce business, which has point of sale required you to build tremendous capabilities, right? And technology and that itself has its own roadmap, right? And we can, we can have a whole separate conversation in terms of how biometrics might play, but that's not what I'm going to go to. The third thing which I really took away, and, and I have to actually apologize to Sander, who I know well, and we talk about it. I actually weren't aware that you were in now the issuing processing business. But what I did hear and actually understood from the conversation I had with him was that this is not issuing consumer cards, right? Do you want to shed some light on what you're doing this whole issuing business and what made you sort of consider this transition? Because this itself is another leap. It is. Um, so there's a few things that uh, continue to uh, define us a bit. One is we work with merchants. We help merchants um, uh, and, and we're looking to solve challenges they run into around payments and related financial uh, services. We're not a consumer brand. We're not looking to offer specific consumer products or have direct relationships with consumers. That's what our customers do. So um, if, if you talk about issuing, that's already all, uh, a bit of some criteria that, that shows like, hey, issuing for us fits into helping our merchants in some of their challenges. Um, um, I'll explain a bit more how we do that. But first of all, um, the thing that we see in issuing, eh, where you issue a card, a uh, credit or debit card, uh, Visa, MasterCard, for example, to someone who can use that to yeah, make payments, um, that's basically the other side of what we used to do. We are a payment processor, an acquirer, which means we help merchants accept payments with those cards we integrate with Visa MasterCard networks. Um, the world of acquiring banks uh, that we have been active in for many years uh, is a world where the traditional players were using pretty old technology. And that old technology was re uh, really limiting merchants in optimizing their business. Lots of stability problems, no access to data and insights. Uh, they had to work with local providers in every country. We changed all that. So our acquiring payment processing business has really been an approach of modern technology to give much more flexibility and having a much more international solution in a standardized way. The same goes for issuing. Because if you look at issuing, a lot of banks that issue cards are also running on these older technologies. Technologies that were built, platforms that were built 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And they're the systems that talk to the same Visa MasterCard platform that we are on the other side of for our merchants. So we're talking to customers and they're like, hey, we are very limited by cards that are being issued to us because, yeah, we uh, are unable to, uh, to limit them and what they do. There's lots of operational problems. We're like, ooh, we recognize this. Um, and we did see merchants coming to us with needs for issuing um, uh, uh, use cases. So an example is um, there's a lot of delivery companies out there, right? So there's delivery com companies that will get you whatever you need within uh, half an hour, whatever. 
food, uh, groceries, etc. These delivery companies have been working with us for quite some time. We process their payments, payments from consumers um, to order items on those delivery platforms. Now, what happens a lot is that these delivery, um, the people that work for the deliver, uh, delivery companies that go and get stuff for you, they often also need to make a payment. Eh? If I'm going to get for you stuff at the supermarket, they'll make a payment. Uh, and in the, pa in, the, in the beginning, they used to carry cash or use their own personal accounts to make a payment and get it to you. Now, we enable these platforms with an issuing solution that enables them to give those delivery people a card and we will only put money on there in the window that they need it for, could be half an hour, and we can set up the account in such a way that that money can only be used at a supermarket. So you avoid that, A, you need to put a lot of cash out there. Yep. So no, you can make it very yep. precise. MCC code specific. MCC code specific. specific. Yep. So it helps in cash management. In hel it helps in automation of process. These are the things we're trying to solve. So you'll, you'll see it's a way to try and use technology, make it more flexible, um, and, and we'll gradually expand that. So again, it's like embedded finance we talked about earlier, how we grew point of sale, the same with issuing. We're going to grow it on the long term, but you just see the flexibility, the new technology has a place. And, uh, and that's, that's how we're You doing know, the it. one thing I'm taking away, mm -hmm. know your customer well. Yes. Stay yeah. close to them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And co-create, if I may use that word, yeah. with them. Yeah. You do those three things well. You yeah, stay in business. You stay relevant. You stay relevant. And I think that the and and the, the thing that's important for us is to always make sure you do things, of course, in a way that many of our merchants can benefit from it. So therefore also you yeah, you want to make sure you have merchants that that are dealing with the same problems. Um, and the other thing that's for us important, we're doing it for the long term. So we're able to yeah, invest in solutions that will take time, that can take time to really grow. But ultimately, that's where a lot of the value is. I'm now going to zoom into the part of the world I come from, right? And uh, there's a surprise in this part also, but I'll unveil the surprise as, as we talk about it, right? Over the last, um, you know, five, seven years, uh, I'm apologies if I got the time wrong, you have really expanded from being a European powerhouse to becoming a global powerhouse. You have a well-established business in the U.S. You're growing at a very rapid race. Uh, you've been in Southeast Asia for, 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 a, for a while or a long time. As a matter of fact, my first interaction with Adian came years ago uh, when I was actually running a retail conglomerate in Southeast Asia. So that is my first interaction with, with Adian. Talk to me a little bit about how did Middle East come into your orbit, right? So what was the thinking behind entering the Middle East? Because, you know, you're a global player and there's a lot of headroom to grow in a number of these markets, right? So why come knocking on the side of the world where I live in? Yeah, no, it, yeah, it, it, it's not a surprise probably that, uh, that, that we talk to our customers and we're looking at like, hey, what what markets are important to them um and um of course there's always plenty of them so we need to prioritize right you can't do everything uh, in one go um but uh, yeah a lot of our retail customers um are very clear about we'd like to grow we have business in the region can you help us um and um we felt at some point yeah we had resources we're growing so we we have more resources to expand um, and then the time is right to uh, to do that so um, customer needs that's the that's the real uh, that's the real driver let, let me let me ask you take a hundred thousand feet view to the Middle East right um, and, and let me sort of pop the surprise the reason I don't have Sander sitting in the room here is because I'm gonna ask him the same very questions he has no clue he's coming on to the couch right I just hope he's appropriately dressed right uh, but I'm gonna ask him the same question just to see if he answers it the same way hundred thousand feet view what is it that you see about the Middle East? Is there something uniquely different? Yeah, what is different? It's um, th th there's of course things that are that are different. Um, um, I, I think on the one hand, um, yeah, the, 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 the nature of of, of retail um, 
is obviously very, very different um, in the region. We than, still than have cash, by the way. In other <laughs> markets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but um, you know, how these conglomerates work, etc. cetera, I need, you need to be there to understand it. And, um, of course, we, in the beginning, you know, you look at it a bit more naively. Oh, we see, re we recognize those brands. That's a great opportunity. Uh, but it, it, it works all differently. Um, while we're here now, yeah, we see that this whole... Um, um, need and drive for unified commerce that we've been working on for a long time, that's landed really well. That's landed really well. And I think there's there's a lot of opportunity uh, to work together with, with brands that, to make that a reality. Excellent. Excellent. I will ask the same very yeah. questions from Sander. Let's yeah, see yeah. what he has to answer. Yeah. I'm conscious of time. Um, my last question, right? Uh, as we, as we started this conversation, or at least in the early part of conversations, we talked about a number of defining trends, right? The one trend I see, and please correct me if I've got this wrong, is the, the competitive mix, right, in the world of payments or fintech is evolving, right? You have the age-old fintechs who were never even called fintechs, you know, some large networks. You have very large, you know, profitable <laughs> fintechs such as yourself, uh, which is quite a treat these days to see and meet. And then you've got the new kids on the blocks, right, who have disruptive technologies, some of the technologies which we can talk about or enough is written about. But what I do is want to do is I want to kind of ask for some, some, take it to a little bit more of a deeper meaning here. So We've heard a lot about stay close to your customer, and I, I know that sort of is the DNA, right? I, I'm assuming that's the DNA, right? Yeah. I, right? What are the other sort of building blocks which will allow Ardian to continue being, uh, and apologies, I keep using the word powerhouse if you don't like it, that's the best, it's the best word I could come up with, over the next sort of five to 10 years? What, what is it that's gonna keep you relevant, ahead of the game, winning? Um, so I, I think we are, there's a few things we've always done. Eh? Listen to our customers. Again, I will repeat it because it's so important to us. That, that's one thing. The other thing is staying very close to the core ID and a, and a really important principle for us that has always been, we strongly believe of building everything we do on this single platform infrastructure. And it can be very attractive to sometimes think, hey, if we buy company X or Y, that's going to give us much faster way to get into a certain market. However, you end up in a space where there's multiple platforms you're running, you're trying to connect them, and ultimately on the long term, we think you create a very uh, messy situation. So that core idea of investing and building on this single platform for all the markets we're operating in, we think is incredibly important. And that's given us a lot of benefits over the years. On the short term, it takes more time. Yep. It's harder. And it's very different to some of your competitors. Yeah. yeah. No, it is. But the thing is, you know, we're sincerely really building with a long-term horizon. There's never any notion of like, this needs to be done in a certain window. And we're, we have a huge sense of urgency, but we're building this company for infinity, right? So there's not like a reason to say no... Of course, when we launch something, we want to be the first, we want to be the best, but we need quality. And quality comes in sticking to this idea of one platform that will ultimately give real benefit, and that's worth it. That's worth the investment, um, and, and I think that that will continue. It also gives us the flexibility to adapt. Uh, there's, there's, there's things we built uh, 15 years ago, payment pages, hosted payment pages, you know, we're deprecating. That's, uh, and you need to be able to do that. Um, one platform keeps it simple. You can make those changes and continue to evolve. Excellent. I love the term. We're building a company for infinity. Yeah. With that, I thoroughly enjoyed this session. I hope it was the same for you. Totally. Right? And thank you again for having us in your office. I think the, you know, we were hosted gracefully by Nina and by Sander. Uh, and, and, you know, we really enjoyed our, our sort of two days here. And whenever next time in, in, in Amsterdam, we'll, we'll come knocking at your door and to come have a cup of coffee. Always welcome. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. It was a pleasure. Thanks. All right.